the scene was dead anyway. A music scene lives, a music scene dies. The stories, however, are immortal. The scene was dead anyway is a look into the lives, communities and music scenes that help shape an entire generation. Hello and welcome to The Scene Was Dead Anyway. I'm your host, Rick Walland. This is episode number 13, and today I'm joined by Don McLean. You might have heard Don's name come up in one of my previous episodes with Emma from Fat Out. Don was an influential figure on the MK Don's DIY scene in the early noughties for his label Fortissimo Records. Don is also the founding member of Action Beat, an instrumental improvisational noise rock band from Bletchley, UK. Often made up of musicians who are available to play the gig on any particular date. They normally have at least four guitarists, a bassist and between one and four drummers. Before we start, if you're watching on YouTube, please could you like and subscribe to my channel to help the podcast grow. And if you're listening on Apple iTunes, please could you leave a review under the ratings and review tab. You can also find me on Facebook. That's facebook.com forward slash the scene was dead anyway. I'm also on Instagram, Instagram instagram.com forward slash the scene was dead anyway. And I'm on Twitter, twitter twitter.com forward slash TSWDA. Just a couple of disclaimers, uh, there was a two second delay for when I spoke and Don hearing what I said, uh, so sometimes it can sound like I'm talking over him, but that's just the uh, delay, so I apologise in advance for that. And also if you're watching on YouTube, you'll notice the audio sometimes goes out of sync with the video, um, so that's just another connectivity issue, uh, but the actual recording, the audio recording itself is clear and and fine for the most part uh, so yeah um, just uh, bear that in mind and I do apologize uh, thanks here's a short clip of Action Beat playing live in France around 2013 <laughs> Welcome to the show, Don. Thanks for coming on. How how's it going? Hey, yeah. Thank you for having me. Thank you. It's a pleasure, man. Um, if you want um, to just yeah, give us a little I'd, I'd say intro about yourself and um, what do you do and where do you live and yeah, for people who don't know. Right. Why why you even asked me on the show? <laughs> <laughs> why did you ask me on the sh- why did you ask me to come on the show um i guess for the people that don't know anything about me or etc why would you know anything about me really um i guess um i'm kind of lumped in um with the early 2000s uk noise rock crew i would say early 2000s maybe mid and then late as well all through i guess the first to the the first tens right that decade i guess yeah i guess i'm yeah. lumped in with that crew yeah um yeah and i had this um <laughs> i had this thing going on in a town called bletchley which is surrounded by another town called milton Keynes, um which i'm sure you're all aware of right yes is yeah this 50 year old town that looks like la 
and it's like um i don't know a lot of potential for a dystopian nightmare to happen there but it's uh, it's a it's a new town centered around a mall and uh square grids like la etc and uh we grew up in in the town called bletchley right uh, i was actually born in scotland but i grew up in bletchley because my parents moved south because of thatcher actually i was, I was always told told that we moved south because of thatcher i'm like all right okay, <laughs> okay. um so i don't know around i don't know around that sort of time i started putting on gigs in this town called bletchley under the name fortissimo um and now god i was i was doing that i was doing fortissimo i was touring around in action beat for a long long time putting on gigs and god about 2010 i moved to new york new york city and yeah. now i live here and i've lived here for 11 years and i'm a i'm a social studies teacher in new york actually I was social ask studies you, yeah. high what, what yeah i'm a uh, stateside <laughs> i'm a social studies high school teacher and um i love my job and everything and I'm, I'm i'm still actively involved in music and um i'm not just i don't know our band we weren't just the 2010s crew and that was it and then we stopped it was like we're still we're still going um, yeah i mean yeah I've, I've got plenty of questions about action beat and um uh, yeah you know, and, uh, uh, but like as you say so you grew up in milton Keynes and right i guess that was where you started really your uh you know going to shows and playing in bands and stuff and you met a lot of the guys i guess who you play with or have played with in the band uh through that scene and you started the label obviously for tcm records so would you mind just uh yeah telling me telling us a bit more about that and what you can remember from what kind of music were you listening to and uh who were you kind of uh inspirations and stuff when you were kind of growing up what kind of music you were listening to god yeah it's um yeah it's a, it's a long story to be honest um it is it's just such a long story and uh it it, it, it kind of takes me back but i guess um i should i should begin where i first started actively getting involved in putting on gigs etc and I'm in Bletchley, yeah, Milton Keynes, and my friends and I are, you know, what's cast as I guess. I guess I don't know if you had it in the north, but but Grebo kids, right? We're Grebo kids. <laughs> I've not heard that. No, what's Gre Do you know? It's like no, you didn't get Grebo. Uh, not, like not in, not in Wigan. That, no. Yeah, it was like <laughs> kids that were into um, alternative rock or any anything alternative uh in bletchley milton Keynes. yeah the, the kids are like tall boy racers a lot of uh listening to i don't know garage and um i don't know later grime music etc bletchley was big for raves actually for dreamscape and um the other one helter skelter and it was downtown right Mm. so uh, all the kids were into that but my friends and i were definitely more drawn to nirvana right for instance right yeah. and heavy sounds uh coming from america right so definitely seattle washington Kugazi, nirvana, yeah. yeah nirvana definitely definitely sonic youth right yeah but early on, man, when I was first getting into this 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 shit, like I'm like 14, 13, 14 at school, and I'm into stuff like Green Day, right? You know, yeah, same <laughs> like, man, same, yeah. You know, we all started in there. Uh, yeah, Dicky, yeah. <laughs> man, you know, and stuff like, yeah, 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 Dicky, stuff like that. Uh, I like placebo. Um, God, I'm. What else are we into? We're into this band called The Junket, actually. They used to come up from um, London. They used to come to Bedford Esquires and stuff. And, uh, you know, they were just influential influential mm. to some kids that were just getting into to learning guitar and stuff. Yeah. So my yeah. friend, uh, his name is Clint, really good friend. You know, I grew up with him since I'm like, what, six years old, really. 
you know, I come, come from Scotland. I've got a Scottish accent and stuff, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting becoming friends with these kids, right? And uh, this this kid in particular, and a few of them, I just grew up with, right? Yeah. And uh, so this kid gets a guitar. We kind of both get the guitars. <laughs> And he's just naturally good at it, man. Uh, for me, I had to practice it. It was one of those things. And I'm like playing the guitar and it's Indian and I'm getting my father like, can you play some fucking songs? And I'm like, I'm trying to learn. <laughs> what kind of stuff did he want you to play? Like, play some tunes. Some, uh, what kind of stuff did your dad did your dad want you to play and what what did he something like something that was appe- uh, appealing to his ears yeah rogers yeah if i played some kenny rogers he would have been happy with that right yeah yeah so but you know what i'm saying right it's like you know you're learning guitar right and um i don't know my friend was just naturally good at it so he was a guitarist and i was a singer and I couldn't sing and grab another guitarist uh this guy uh tom spaven his name was and uh he was really good as well like prodigy style on the guitar and we get this kind of mickey mouse cover band going with a drummer as well his name is rich (laughs) and we arrange at 15 years old like our first gig at the youth club the youth club center bletchley milton Keynes. you can uh get it up for your viewers it's called yeah. derwent drive youth club derwent drive youth club. and we arranged this gig we were yeah we were 15 years old and it was uh doing uh like covers like nirvana covers and green day covers and we did a placebo cover and uh god what else did we do i'm trying to think i don't know whatever man you know it was like my first time on stage mm. It was just being in a band, wasn't it? Like when you first, it's just everything is so new and so like, just exciting and like fucking hell, I'm playing in a band. I'm, you know, I'm doing gigs. Yeah. Like, Whoa, what the hell? You know, it's that. It was great. It was this huge, huge hall, right? Derwent Drive Youth Club. For me, anyway, a fifteen-year-old kid, it was a huge hall. and we had to get everything together. We had to get the PA, all the amps, etc. And we get onto the stage and I'm like, got tons of butterflies getting onto the stage. But as soon as I got on there, I've got this mic and uh, I'm looking at the back of the room. And, and ever since then, I was just like absolutely hooked. That was it. Yeah. And yeah. I did that at 15. I thought, I thought, well, putting on a gig now is easy. But shit's easy. Right? I'm just going to, you know, I was developing my taste after then from 15 years old onwards. Yeah. And by the time I'm like... 18 19 uh i'm more confident uh with my listening what bands i'm into right i'm into it's better bands than green day and, and placebo quite frankly i mean a sonic youth and shit uh Fugazi. Fugazi, big black shellac uh okay yeah all of it touch and go i was absolutely obsessed with it i became obsessed with it to the point where you know i'm ordering all these records off southern records pretty much every week this mm. was mail order this was mail order when i'd have to you know you'd have to it would the, the 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 internet was so primitive you had to print off the order form and i'd write it all out yeah and then send my stuff in and then weeks later you'd get the the vinyl or the cds in the mail from southern wow yeah and um i don't know about the time i'm 18 19 they're putting on ATP, right? And the first one that we went to was the Mogwai one, right? And we're big fans of Mogwai. And I'm just... a massive fan of Mogwai at this point. So, you, but... so you, you're happy with the news? Yeah, go on. <laughs> oh, great, man, isn't it? Album of the... Uh... Yeah, I was absolutely loving it, actually. I've just, I've just got it in the post as well, actually. Um, I got it from Temporary Residence, obviously. It's the um, the new Mogwai uh, album. It's the American. It's, it's the it's the American release. Yeah. So I don't know. I was going to talk about that actually. So yeah, I'm glad, through, I'm man. glad I've got that. Yeah, I just yeah. There you go. Right. It's really uh, nice. I have though. had it on. Yeah. Um, I've been talking to my friend about it. Like we grew up with it, and um, 
just grew up with Mogwai, you know. Um, they were an early band when I first started listening to them. And I just thought they were so cool, right? Like with, with their jazz masters and like, I don't know, they seemed like this dark Scottish black humor band mm. and I loved them. Mm. Uh, and I loved that they were Scottish because I was Scottish as well, right? And, um, you know, I've got the English accent and everything, but you know what Scottish people are, right? They're bloody, they're forced to be proud, aren't they? My parents yeah. <laughs> made me be proud of being Scottish. And I am, right? I'm not a nationalist or anything, but I'm, I'm really deeply into, um, you know, I'm proud of you. Yeah, yeah. And, stuff, you're, you're right? and so they've got a band. Like you've got a band that everyone's appreciating. It was nice. It was a good, it was a good time. It was a good feeling. Mm. But they did mm. their ATP and we all went we had this band at the time called akari right it's me clint who's the decent guitarist my very good friend called lewis webb who i also grew up with since i was like five um and he's on bass and then we've got a drummer called stuart southwell and we all went like this four piece crew went to atp um for the Mogwai uh, ATP weekend, it was just the, it was the best man. It was like the best experience when you when you're that age. I can't. So so for people who don't know, what's what's ATP? Um, how would you describe it? It's no longer a. <laughs> uh, it's pretty much. Yeah, it's it sucks that it, it, it sucks that it doesn't go anymore. I'm trying to like figure out. I guess he he was doing too many. Is my uh, take on it all? I I read that he he, he went like bankrupt or whatever. He, he was basically getting huge artists and then not being able to basically afford it and and he just like went under so yeah i don't know but i went to a couple yeah it was but yeah it's basically like a it's a, mu a music festival um usually held at like <laughs> some like holiday resort or something like butlins or something um i guess it's the main old it would have been the main alternative to like glastonbury and leeds and reading yeah right i mean we went we were all always at the reddings because it was close to milton Keynes. you know it was yeah. easy for us to get to it was an experience it was great loved it and everything but atp was uh by far the superior festival um just more intellectual music really on mm. offer um deeper music than what was available at Reading, quite frankly. Uh, and they had the curating you know, thing as well, didn't they? Like someone would curate, like pick the entire lineup, basically. Like a... yes. So Mogwai were were picking the lineup that year, and and you had like Godspeed, you Black, yeah. Emperor, um, who at the time were still an unknown band, and you know seeing them are great, amazing, of course, right? And then they've got Shellac on the bill. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just really. Um, I was, I was, I was glad to be at those festivals, um, and it really inspired me. Okay, um, and at this time, I'm getting more interested in the idea of starting to put on gigs and take the idea of putting out music more seriously mm. than I am than than my 15 year old youth club and 18 year old band called akari i'm thinking i need to get more uh professional about this let's get a label together right yeah and yeah. fugazi fugazi and ian mckay and discord and mm. knowing about touch and go and southern and stuff that just that that was the um the influence of course right mm. mckay and what those guys were doing in dc uh resonated with me and that story because if you've ever have you ever been to dc like, i've never been to the states no no obviously crap yeah. you know <laughs> <laughs> down to, to all the musical DC's. places yeah down, like downtown dc is like like rome yeah downtown dc seems like rome but i just see it as quite a crappy city as well like kind of milton Keynes ish and yeah. uh they talk about that and they discuss how they built community um from the ground up and with always a desire to get the youth involved uh yeah. with this 
strong community scene that was built from music right so that resonated yeah, 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 with yeah, that yeah, story yeah 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 um the atps continued and we continued going to the next one that i went to i missed the ortega one actually i always kicked myself for that one but uh we went to the the taurus one right the next one and i gotta tell the story i'm sorry right it's it's, it's a no, long no, one right fine. but um yeah. <laughs> we go to the tortoise one uh and where's it being held which uh which place is it Cam- camber sands right camber sands, camber, yeah. sa- camber sands it's all it's initially always at camber sands but that's folkstone isn't it yeah I'm, yes. i didn't go to that one i went to the uh minehead one uh, but you least... went to the later Minehead ones, yeah, yeah, yeah right. right. The yeah. early ones were the other side of England, on the east, south east, there, uh, Camba, Folkestone, I believe. Is it? I'm getting my geography right. I'm a geography teacher, Mister McLean. Come on. <laughs> um, anyway, it's the Tortoise. It's the Tortoise Festival. Yeah. Right. And I've got this new band now called Riot Men. Okay, Riot Men. We picked the the crappiest name in history, but whatever, we took it. Right. Mm-hmm. Got this new band. No, actually, I'm I'm actually lying here. <laughs> We've got Akari. We go to the festival. Yeah. Right? We've got Akari. It's the four piece. We go to the festival. Tortoise. And my friend, this bassist, right, Lewis Webb, plays an action league now. Right, he's, he's the bassist. The guy. Who's he's always got his top time, off. Right? Yeah, that's him. Um, <laughs> that's him. That's him. That's top him, off guy. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah the short basis right that's him we're going to the festival we've got this band called akari the kid he's a kid and he's complaining about his stomach oh i feel so you know, like what you know we're kids at the time and yeah, yeah, yeah. all we're thinking about is getting there and like yeah right yeah he's just miserable talking about his stomach oh bent over <laughs> So we're walking towards our chalet and he starts like violently puking on the floor and stuff. Like, oh. What the fuck? Like, oh shit. Get into his room. Don't worry, don't worry, Web. Just rest, just rest. So we're putting him to to bed to rest and stuff. And he's like getting up. And he's like, oh, I gotta go and watch a few bands, right? And I'm like, <laughs> If you if you feel like it, mate, you know, come on, let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we all go, and we're kind of like walking him. And he's like, oh, and we're walking him to the venue. Right, and the first band on the tourist weekend are was the X. Right? Oh, and the that's X, man. Im- it's Im- it's important for my story. Um, but the X seeing them, um, it's absolutely incredible. It was around the time they just released Dizzy Spells, right? But they were playing tracks from Starters Alternators as well, I believe. And their singer uh, was called GW Sock at the time. And they're playing on stage. Uh, they're the first band of the Taurus Weekender. And I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen a band interact that way Um together and it was mm. it was just so impressive the way that they were kind of reading each other's minds and it was all there and uh yeah. totally mind-blowing and very important for my development as a musician because the way that they were treating the guitars and, and the things that they were doing to the guitars um mm. <laughs> i'll just never forget it and they had this thing where it was very important to me because they were obviously going off visual cues but they'd rush the stage together, the two guitarists, uh, Andy and Thierry, and the, uh, Terry, and they'd rush the stage together. And it's kind of this explosive piece of music, and they come in, and the, the rhythm section's always keeping it going. And yeah. Yoss has um, got this political, political, poetic deliverance, which I loved, right? Yeah. So my friend, me and my good friend, Webb, were watching this. Uh, selfies there, etc. We're all there. And then afterwards, we went back to the chalet, right? And we're just back at the chalet trying to chill, right? We're 18 year olds, you can imagine, right? And he goes back to bed. And a couple hours later, I think the, the guys were playing poker or something. I don't know. We just hear this blood curdling scream from uh, the next room, man. And um, shit, man, my friend was like, ah, my, my, 
ah, ça va se faire, 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 ça Canvas Sands, Folk Zone, you know, Puntins get, well, was it Puntins? No, it was Puntins, get to Puntins, right? Pumpkins. So the ambulance come, security turn up, the ATP security, and they're like, what are you doing? And we're like, <laughs> my friend, his stomach, you know, it's gone like this. And they're like, you should have called us. What's he been having? What oh, drugs are you taking? You know, yeah. how much alcohol? And we were like, dude, he's come. He's just like, you know, we're kids at the time. He's, he's just come. Uh, and he was complaining about his stomach and blah, and the ambulance like taking it and it doesn't look good for him man eventually they take him off and um, we lay, we learn the next morning of his parents right that like his appendix exploded right? I was going to say it sounded exploded. like something so really, like that yeah he was really really lucky um, to be alive to be honest right so not not only did we see this band that changed our life but webb was really lucky to not only see them but be alive <laughs> and i'm laughing no. about it because i'm like I'm just even thinking about it makes me like nervous right and yeah god this is even weirder but the week after that Mogwai, Webb's still in the bloody hospital, you know, all sewn up and stuff. He's lucky to be alive. Week after that, Mogwai do their show um, on the Isle of Butte, right? So you, you, we went out to Glasgow, drove, mm. no, we went up to Edinburgh, drove across to Glasgow, then took a boat to the Isle of Butte, see the Mogwai gig and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I'm not at the record store and I'm like, I got to get Webb, I got to get Webb a present. Got to get Webb a present. <laughs> He's in the hospital. I'm like, I gotta get him a present. So I find eventually the this X seven inch, you know. <laughs> oh, lovely! It was cool. I was like, you know, this this band, this band is uh, really important to us now, and uh, we can always think about this band as the band that um, we shared before you almost died. Oh, and when wow, he came yeah, back, yeah. right, and he's all good, and we wanted, yeah, when he came back and he's all good, and, and we wanted to um, think about developing our sound, mm. we talked about the X and, and how we needed to rip off those cues, etc., <laughs> and not rip them off, but you know what I mean. Be, in, yeah. be, be, be influenced by them. I know. Uh, well, yeah, they, yeah. if, if the, it, I guess, I guess people would now look at me and think, yeah, God, you did rip off the, the X's cues, but. It's being influenced by them. My terminology is. Uh... Everybody's influenced by someone, aren't they? At the end of yeah, the day, no. you know. Yeah, there's always what there's always plagiarism in art, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. I don't know. I mean, you can use that word, or you can use um, inspired. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after that, we have the near death experience with 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 Web. We get this band called uh, Riot Man. This is when we get it, right? We get this band called Riot Man, who is directly influenced by um, Fugazi, Shellac, and the X. And that's what we want to sound like. And that's what we want to be. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do. And that informs everything about us, right? So we're practicing every week, etc. right? In our friend's garage. And, and I don't know why, man, but I'd been doing these gigs at a place called Zach's and Milton King's, just local band stuff and for us to play, etc. And I see that the X uh, were touring or were getting a tour uh, together. Hmm. And I thought, why not, man? I'm just gonna I'm gonna email them, I'm gonna try and sort out a gig. I'm gonna get it together, see what they say, and they turn around and forgive me, Andy or Tira. Terry, if any of you are listening or whatever, but they were like, "Yeah, we'll we'll play your show in uh, you know Wolverton and Milton Keynes. It's a uh, three hundred and fifty pound guarantee." And I'm like twenty years old or whatever, maybe nineteen. And I'm like, "This at the time is shitloads." Yeah. <laughs> it's like my Pizza Hut wages. <laughs> yeah. It's my Pizza Hut wages for the week, yeah. right? Three hundred pounds, and they're like, "Yeah, you know, we're." Um, 
we can get loads more than that in London. And of course, they're, and they're really nice about it and cool and stuff. And of course, mm. the band needs to get paid and stuff. Yeah, it's yeah. the first time I was ever dealing with anything like a rider and stuff like that. It was my mm. first important gig, right? The X at uh, Wolverton, Zach's in Wolverton, right? It's my first important gig. Um, and it meant a lot to me that I, I pulled that off and, and seeing them at ATP influenced me. It influenced my band. Mm. I ripped them off as I, I just uh, um, confessed to you guys, right? They, they yeah. just informed every, everything about my life, right? Them, Frugazi, Shellac, and influenced me a lot, right? Put on this first gig, very, very nervous about it. <laughs> I was just like, you know, kid putting on these people that are regarded as my heroes, man. I'm so really is it under your, was it under your label? But, like, and the, the... under Fortissimo Records, which yeah. at this point has released like one glass master CD. No, one CDR in a pizza box that we painted. <laughs> um, some other sort Great, of Mickey man. Mouse CDR. Yeah another Mickey Mouse CDR, and then we had done One Glass Master, Fortissimo Records. So this is our thing. This is my thing, Fortissimo Records. Yes. And I get this Glass Master CD, the right man, and I'm just calling everything Fortissimo Records anyway. Even if I'm putting on a gig, it's Fortissimo Records Presents, you know. Mm. So was it a label? No, because I'm a terrible businessman, and I've got... <laughs> I shouldn't be involved in business at all. I always lose money. Even though the X was my first professional gig, right? It's 350 pounds plus all the riot. Uh, I put them up somewhere for free because the youth club in Stony Stratford helped me out. So that was cool, right? Yeah. Um, but it was a lot of money for a kid and no one came to my fucking gig on a Wednesday, you know? And I'm begging everyone to come to the gig in town. Right, I'm begging everyone. I'm putting it around. I'm, I'm putting it on the local forum. I get it in the, the local paper. I'm saying you've got to come and watch this Anaco punk band. Right, they're legendary. They yeah. played Chumba Wumba years ago. They played with Crass years ago. They were on. They were distributed by such and such and such. They're on Touch and Go Records. They were recorded by Steve Albini. Please come and watch this band. Yeah. Everyone in Milton Keynes are like, yeah, yeah, of course I'll be there, mate. Yeah, you know what I mean, mate. Yeah, of course I'll check them out, you know. And it's a Wednesday. I'm sitting on the, the, the door, right? And fuck all people are coming. And I'm just like, oh, oh shit. Yeah, it really drains you. It does. But for that, I couldn't, it didn't matter to me because I was putting on my heroes. I lost a week's wages. But they were really cool about it. I got to see him in an intimate setting. And uh, Terry, the ex, was really cool. And he gave me a ton of CDs, which I've still got to this day. Oh, Even though I don't keep any CDs, I kept I kept my ex CDs because uh, he gave them to me. And Jos was really cool, uh, who I'll talk about later on today. Um, and they were, Andy was really cool cat they were really cool they're sound people everything about them it was just so great and so inspiring that was my mm. early stuff and after the x i just kept on contacting bands man more and more bands yeah i actually saw them supporting mel banana yeah. uh islington mill i i actually <laughs> actually enjoyed they were supporting what do you I think? Was like, they were i was like the fucking hell did better than mel banana you know i was like i've come to see mel banana but this fucking band uh just incredible <laughs> that's what i felt on the night when i was there that's quite a like melt me down yeah, fantastic quite a lineup, to be honest. you know uh like got in a mosh pit and not been in a mosh pit for ages and it was like felt like i was 15 again jumping about you know uh, oh nice yeah but uh, it's into mill yeah he's into mill in salford yeah um and i, yeah. I saw yeah, I, know, him, I know it well yeah and i saw the x at atp as well it was um, 2010. I think it was the uh, God. Was it, it, was... Yeah, it was the Godspeed one, I think. Yeah, 2010. They picked, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they were on at like three o'clock in the yeah, morning they're an on the main band. stage, and I was just like, I had a nap. Oh wow! And turned up on the main stage, and they played, and everybody was just fucking jiving and jumping around, like you know, old school punkers and stuff with like, uh, yeah, you know, mohawks and stuff, and I was like, wow, oh, this is great. One of the best gigs ever, man. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah it's funny that you bring up melt banana actually um i love melt banana for a start um but we did play with them in in sweden once and uh you know we're quite a confident band if i do say so um so this is with action beat that you played yeah this is of action beat later i'm just i don't know if you want to get this in later but um we're touring and we we play with um melt banana and we're as i said we're a confident band and we're like we can share the stage with any band really but um <laughs> melt banana went on before us and we're like oh no man like, they su- oh right so they were kind of like is... supporting <laughs> they went on before <laughs> us because of time or something yeah and we we're like that is just an incredible wow. band yeah. man like I mean, yeah, they blew, blew us out of the well. water, you know. It's like, you, yeah, I mean, we still went on and held our own and everything, but it's like, you know, they're really, really brilliant bands, yeah. And technically smart, intelligent, and uh, just the longevity as well is great. So uh, you started hmm. Action Beat in 2004, right. and you've played around mm-hmm. 700 shows, apparently, according to your. <laughs> to your uh, Bank camp. Uh, That's what it says, does it? Yeah. Uh, bl- yeah. Bl- blurb. Um, so, uh, I mean, obviously, you, you talked about Riot Men before. That was like the kind of pre. Was that like the precursor to Action Beat? Uh, yeah, I wonder if I can get my CD. Can I just go and have a look? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I've man. got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so I've got uh, this this band called um, Riot Men that is influenced by. Sorry, the ex Fugazi Shellac primarily, mm. um, and you know I'm I'm oh God I've got my guitar so I just get my guitar and I'm doing all these like you know the sort of shellac chords it's all up here and uh, some sort of bichord ship and to me it's like getting to the stage where it's been done. A million times hmm. now i had always um i i had always tried with my band so we had we had done this recording at southern studios um in in london right it was uh God, what was the track? i don't even remember 10 middleton road i think it was in london right really cool right studio a ton of people had recorded there Harvey Burrell uh, engineered us, the Riot Men, right? It's my first professional recording, really professional, you know? They did it on a two inch tape. Uh, God, this is really early 2004. And uh, we get this CD pressed. It's called a Glassmaster CD, which is like a professional uh, press as opposed to a CDR. Now, this is, it sounds like, yeah, whatever, but to, to a kid trying to develop his label, this yeah. is a big ill because i went from you know these cdrs to um moving on to this glass master right so it's this i'm thinking right the label's going to develop and it's going to get you know it's going to go places etc um but at the same time secretly um not not even secretly but just like I, I, i always one of these people i don't know if you can relate to this but like with drawing or art and i'm always like reflecting and i want it to be better or move to different places i'm never content Mm. it's like my argument Mm. that i can't really put that i can't really put tattoos on myself personally even though i like them on other people i just wouldn't be content with it i'm like i don't know i'm too like fidgety and i've got to be moving (laughs) i've got to be moving so i've got this band with called riot men one i'm really pissed off about the name I hate it because it's called Riot Men. And I think, oh, great. Did a 10-year-old make your name? All right, that's really annoying. Two, I'm like, I'm not a good enough a guitarist to keep playing these chordy riffs. And uh, I'm definitely not putting in any solos in it. We're a three-piece. Where's that going? And I'm like, I want to get more noisy, like, instrumental sonic youth right i want to be like lightning bolt like i want to be like lightning bolt right and i want to come in to a room and just like 
rip a guitar apart right rip it apart and like so it's just uncomfortable that people can't yeah. even like be in i want to do that like a sonic my assault chordy sort of. songs yeah my chordy songs about like this 18 year old political stuff that i'm talking about right yeah like my crappy take on marxism or whatever it is riot men it's just not cutting it anymore for me really and so i had always been playing uh, in the kind of Sonic Youth um, tunings anyway, you know, it's like two E's, I don't know, two E's and two D's, right? And I don't know, for a couple of C's in there or whatever, right? Now tune the strings so they're in unison. I'm not going to do it, but you tune the strings so they're in unison and it kind of doubles up on the tone. This just allowed for this kind of sonic assault from the guitar, right? And you could just, just like absolutely rip it apart, right? Just put the distortions on put some delays on and uh you know tear it apart on the guitar right so this is uh my idea i think for what i want a band to be like mm. right we're getting more and more into um lightning bolt in 2000 well 2003 etc and my friend's like i want to start a kind of two-piece noise rock band right Two piece noise rock band. He's like, you be the drummer, Don. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm a, sh- I'm a <laughs> shit drummer. <laughs> You're not like Brian, Brian Chippendale. Fucking. No, no, I'm not like Brian Chippendale. He's a beast. That's all right. <laughs> I, yeah, he's just like, yeah, he's, he's otherworldly, right? And he's a, he's a real drummer. I'm not a drummer, I'm a guitarist. So my friend's like, I want you to be the drummer. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's do some practices. And we're doing these crappy songs, trying to sound like Light and Bolt with me playing as fast as I can. It's awful. Really is awful. Uh, But we're sitting around and we think it's quite fun anyway. Mm. So we decide that even though I'm a rubbish drummer and he's a rubbish bassist, um, together, if we keep going at it, surely we'll get decent. (laughs) We'll get get good at this. so stupid and you know i've got this other band called riot men who i think is my professional band and i've got this <laughs> other band on the side and I, we call it action b right we call it action b I'm like, what the fuck what what um, about that name then where's that where does that come from action it's so it's so it's so stupid it's so stupid we've got this so i'm trying to get the context but it's it's me I can't play any drums and my friend he can't play bass and we just get into a practice room and we just make loads of noise and try and make it sound as good as possible that's what we do right um, so we're sitting around and we want to call it a ridiculous name we do we're influenced at the time by do you remember all the load record stuff no do you know load records so they were lightning bolts lightning bolt were put out by load records uh they put out usa's a monster usa's a monster yeah, uh, them. sightings yeah sightings um and i think they might have even done some stuff by aids wolf right this band called AIDS oh yeah wolf. i remember them yeah. and even AIDS the name wolf. you you don't forget a name like that so even <laughs> <laughs> so even even the name AIDS them, yeah. wolf right tell tells you what early 2000s noise rock was about right? it was it was kind of some sort of shock and awe shit going on as well which no one at the time was ashamed about um there's also a band called pink and brown right yeah which i was gonna is, mention them you know yeah. it's a guy he's he's like coach and oc and his... all that and he the uh the main guy in that band yeah coach Whips, Dwyer, OCs. right yeah yeah, yeah. John Dwyer, right? John Dwyer, that's it, yeah. That's his name. So there's all this, yeah, there's all this stuff at the time. And um, everyone is into this sort of half comical, half, it's half art, half comedy, sort of noise rock. This is what it is coming from Load Records. And being my friend, especially this other band called men's recovery project right if any of your listeners want to check them out they're really cool really weird 
we wanted to be like them and we wanted to wear masks and just be weird and uh it was kind of like an in-joke band action beat for me and carney right me and this kid called james carney right it was an in-joke band <laughs> but we needed a name and this is going to sound so stupid it is it's going to sound so stupid to you <laughs> go on <laughs> but we had this friend called uh john grant and my kid's sitting in the other room she's got her headphones on but um there's this kid a kid called john grant who we were friends with <laughs> and he just used to make up scenarios in which a person may be put in a comp a man may be put in a compromised position if they were masturbating right that's that's the best way i can put it right for instance he would say a danger beat right a danger beat right you're beating yourself off but it's a danger beat because oh, okay right yeah. and this 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 is his scenario this this is what he used to, this was his joke right and he would talk about it he would say you could be <laughs> you could be upstairs kind of jerking off relieving yourself right yeah and then shout <laughs> mother right <laughs> <laughs> okay okay yeah she's on the way up yeah and you have to like get it over and done with before it comes in that's the that's his humor i mean like what the fuck man and he would go on about various other i don't know just coming up for he was really obsessed with it and he just used to talk about this stuff man and uh he would have a scenario and then the word beat. Right. So one day we we're just sat around obsessed with saying it. So I was like, I quite like the idea of action beat, right? I'm, I'm sitting around like, just like, I like the idea of action beat, John. You know like, what? I'm like, I don't know. You know, you're just doing it everywhere. I guess you're just running around. I guess you're on assault courses and you're just doing it anywhere. Just It's, <laughs> it's an action. You've got to take. <laughs> just do it wherever you go right just go crazy <laughs> and it's an action beat and i was like oh that sounds really good actually um and it, it works with the idea that it's supposed to be this repetitive drum band right yeah 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 it's supposed to be this like repetitive <laughs> and it's centered around um what i thought i was going to be a really good drummer i thought i was going to be a really good drummer i'm not going to lie to the audience uh, so i thought okay right well action beat that's going to work and it sounds so nice and yeah, our friends so... at the time were kind of like we're trying we're trying to get our own band names together how would you come up with something so good and we're like well <laughs> really it's just john grant's <laughs> stupid ridiculous humor it was only so, because of john grant's ridiculous humor off, <laughs> he had action yeah danger danger beats uh I don't know, traveling fast, like car beats, uh, all sorts of beats he would come up with. That was his imagination and would talk to tell us about it. And we're like, John. And yeah, action, you know, and... you do some, you, you hear some stupid shit when you're a kid. Right in the song, was it, was it all just, um, was it, was it all improvised or did you, did you have a process for writing the songs? Because obviously it changed a lot over the years. You had different like members in the band and, in the end it, it's become this huge like almost like yeah. a ensemble of free drummers and a few guitarists and basses and yeah um it's a long story god it's a long just... <laughs> and i even thinking about it, it takes its time it was it was it's, it's a long band it's still going um but we're starting 2004 as this joke two-piece band right yeah we play this thing called battle of the bands right battle of the bands in in milton Keynes, and my friend carney bought a wireless um a wireless receiver to go into his base um so he could go out into the audience uh Allah, and we ripped this off again right influenced um whatever you want to call it we ripped this off from the oxes and my friend was going around in the battle of the bands <laughs> while i'm on the stage 
gassed out after about two minutes on the drums because I can't play it. Man. I'm not even joking. I was so crap, right? And he's just <laughs> ragging this guitar, making it such a noise, right? And the battle of the bands in Milton Keynes, I mean, you can sort of imagine the sort of music that was being played on yeah. that night. Uh, it's like this awful, God, God, like almost Christian rock is what some of the bands in Milton Keynes sounded like to me, right? So me and my friend just thought, oh, this is going to be fun, just going on the Battle of Bands and absolutely ripping the noise uh, through their big PA system and stuff. And after we did that, I was just like, Carney, never going to be a good drummer. I'm a guitarist. I am a guitarist. And let's both just play guitar, right? Let's both put it in Sonic Youth tunings, right? Uh, and for instance, I can get it. Yeah, there. So you can hear it. Let's just put it in the Sonic Youth tunings, right? Yeah. And we'll just absolutely just rip it. Just rip it, right? Yeah. And we need a beat. We need a beat. So let's use my crappy Zoom drum machine that I've got, right? And we'll just. Oh, you put started on, out with a drum machine? Uh, the standard. There pre you go. <laughs> Yeah, man. We, I, I said, so put on the standard uh, drum patterns and let's just absolutely rip it over the, the drum machine. And it sounded so good. I loved it, actually. Um, yeah, so we had this drum machine. And then one Christmas, right? it's Christmas 2005. Oh, and I know there's footage out there somewhere, but it's Christmas 2005. And me and Carney are like, we're going to do an action beat tour on Christmas Day. And we're posting it around on our local, you know, forums in Milton Keynes and stuff. We're saying we're doing a Bletchley, we're doing a, we're doing our Milton Keynes tour uh, action beat on Christmas Day. And we're going to play in all these places. And we listed them all, right? And the idea. <laughs> so you shared a picture we of this recently, this didn't generator. you, on uh, Instagram? Of of the uh... yeah man i'm really proud of, of that i did this yeah you might be able to show your viewers uh yeah. it's like under a the, bridge the picture uh, like outside uh, I did like a gig it is yeah and, and and that underpass is uh near my house actually so me and uh my friend and i rather got hold of a generator we hired the generator and we got together our crappy amplifiers right and it's Christmas Day, um, and you know you're English, aren't? Well, you're not English, but you know I'm Scottish. You're British. British, yeah. <laughs> and uh, they're offering you drinks, um, you know, for Christmas Day. People celebrate and stuff. But I, I stayed sober all day so I could drive around. Uh, that's not an achievement either. But to drive <laughs> around Milton Keynes, all the uh, in my <laughs> God, it was it was a yeah, it was a red Mercedes. <laughs> Uh, hatchback I, I had off my stepdad at the time and me and my friends drove around with generator me and my friend James Carney drove around with a generator uh, a drum machine two guitars and two amps and we drove around to all these spots and our friends followed us it was cool wow. and we did we played great. four we played four times it was great we did two underpasses uh, that were quite close to us uh, quite close to our houses uh, and then we played on top of a bridge that went across um, the old A5, which is the Roman uh, A5. It's Watling Street, right? So the Romans built that road. It's brilliant. Right? And we played wow. on a bridge across it. So that was nice. Um, actually, playing that gig, I remember playing, and I see this cop car come speeding down with its uh, blue sirens. I stopped. I was like, shit, right? Pack up. Let's go. Bobby's. They didn't come back, you know, and it's like, great. I know, I was, I was kind of like... So we, we packed that up, and then the last gig we played was at the skate park in Milton Keynes, which is actually a really famous uh, place and cool in its own right. When we did that on Christmas Day, I was really, really uh, proud that my friend and I pulled it off. And it was like, yeah, it was... I remember being a kid thinking, yeah, man, you know, these bands far more important to me than any Christmas crap. You know, I was like, I was one of those kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought, 
I thought, and I still do, I still do. I'm going to tell you, it's one of the most important things in my life, being in a band. Um, it definitely is. I didn't take it lightly, you know, I, I, I didn't take it lightly. I, I saw it as, um, yeah, there's something you had to be responsible with, right? You had a responsibility. Mm. Um, mm. So after the, yeah, after the drum machine, um, after the drum machine, I thought, I said to Carney, let's uh, not bother with the drum machine. Let's get a boy, my drummer, from Riot Man. Let's get him. His name was James Walsh, right? His name was, his name is James Walsh. Yeah, um, so he joined Action Beat a bit, and then he became kind of the drummer, right? Drummer. The first drummer of Action Beat. Now early on, <laughs> oh, apart from yourself, <laughs> he's not the first. He's not the. He's, no, he can't be the. Yeah, he is. He is. But I'm the first drummer. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Walshy is the first drummer, isn't he? Yeah, Walshy is the first drummer. But the first recorded drummer, the first recorded drummer, actually on this record. He's showing us a uh, yep. first there copy of. <laughs> this is great. This no, this is this is historic, and this it should be worth something. <laughs> first action and maybe not even, release. No, maybe <laughs> maybe not even for us, but for the other person that's on it. Um, right, yeah, this is the first action be release. This is it. Look at that, beautiful. Yeah, Should it is. Yeah, dog. it's a nice drawing. Oh, I like it's that. A good yeah. dog. Yeah, yeah, it's cool, man. Um, let me tell the story of this god so it takes a while to get to that place because we stop with the drum machine and i get a uh, good friend james walsh and he's the drummer and we need him for we don't need him but you know we ask him for a tour that i'm booking right i'm more and more heavily involved in gigs now right and by this point in my life uh, 2005-ish I had put on a ton of bands in Bletchley Milton Keynes right, at this place called the Leisure Centre and various venues booked the first UK tune uh, which involved getting visas etc Neptune are a band that hand make that metal instruments etc and really yeah, cool know, yeah. noise bands yeah. so I booked the first UK tour for them yeah and I had done things with touring with USA as a monster. Yep. And our band Riot Men had also done a tour in France, right? So I'm getting more and more experienced, right? Now, my next tour is with this band that Carney turns me on to, uh, who's my action B guitarist, right? He turns me on to this band called Parts and Labor. Yeah. No, so Parts and Labor, yeah. Parts and Labor I booked there. Yeah, I book their first UK tour and get the visas and everything. And Dom Chinchilla actually drives our tour. <laughs> do you know Dom Chinchilla? I do. You it's know really... what? They they played a show in Wigan and they stayed at this house. And Dom, I think Dom Chinchilla yeah. stayed here as well. Like, so they played a show in Wigan and then, like, yeah, I was chatting to the drummer and stuff, you know. Um, yeah, they were cool guys. He used to drive everyone round in his. He used to drive everyone round in his white sprinter, at the time. Right, it was legendary. If you were in a band at the time, you might have seen, <laughs> or at least been in Dom Chinchilla's white van, and um, he came on the part. He drove the Parts and Labour tour. It was really cool. And um, for the Parts and Labour tour, I wanted Action Beat to support, right? Not only because I wanted to be there with Parts and Labour the first time that they came to the UK, but also because I wanted to get Action B out there. It was absolutely a shit ton of work that me and Carney had to put into it, especially myself, right? I had to do all the visas and stuff like this. I had to do all the booking. Yeah. Me and Carney had to pay some money for the van rental and stuff, equipment hire, 
And I thought, you know what, Action Beat's getting getting the support, right? <laughs> now, Parts and Labour are coming over for the tour. And I remember at the time, BJ tells me that he needs a bass amp, right? And he gives me this specific bass amp that he wants and stuff. And my friend um, at the time, um, we went to college together. His name is Peter Taylor. I remember um, he had just got this bass amp, right? And he had got a baritone guitar, actually. I can't remember if he started playing bass with us at first. I think, yeah, he was playing a little bit of bass with us at first. And then he decided to get a baritone guitar, right? Mm. So then we go on the Parts and Labour tour. This is really early action beat. Don't even... We kind of know what band we are, but not not yet. We're developing. And so we went on the action, the action beat parts and labor tour as a four piece. And that's basically our first tour. Me, Carney, me, James Carney, James and Peter Taylor with parts and labor who were like, we had Dom Chinchilla as well. So his van was fucking loaded and we went up and down the country. It was cool, man. And um, I don't know, man. People that, this is what I noticed, right? And this is why I'm telling the story. What I noticed is that from previous tours, being with USA as a monster and touring with them as Riot Men, because we were asked, I noticed that people weren't really so receptive to Riot Men, right? <laughs> laughing about it because because we were this like chordy band with me singing my interpretation of marxism <laughs> and sort of bellowing it out and trying too hard to be like shellac and fugazi and the x and i think yeah. people saw that a million miles away and plus the fact we were called riot Men really sucked no one liked that we were called Riot Men because it's like, well, were you and Webb five years old when you came up with that name? I actually, I actually, <laughs> I actually, I actually don't mind that anyway. name to be honest, but just personal <laughs> preference. Yeah, some people don't. So, yeah, yeah, some people really like it. Some people have said, Don. Yeah, some people are like, Don, you're making it up in your head, but that was always my take on it. So anyway, uh, we get Action Beat on this tour and I've just felt like people were more receptive to it. And it was like people that I had admired, I admired in mm. the noise, rock, DIY British scene at the time. A lot of people in Leeds, Manchester, Nottingham, um, Glasgow even. Uh, the people in bands, I'm not going to yeah. make anyone blush by by saying their names right but they know who they are right all these people i admired suddenly had come to the action beat tour and were like oh look you know your your action beat band's actually pretty fucking good you know yeah, uh, yeah. you're really nice tonight and blah 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 and we were getting it was just noticeable and i knew i just knew rick that we were a really good band i just mm. knew it you know i i could i could sense it I could sense it so yeah i'd already recorded that Southern Studios with Riot Men. And now I'm like, right, Action Beat's got to get a, it's got to get a record. Carney, James Carney. We've got to get a fucking record. We've got to do it. We've got to do it properly. And we're going to do it at uh, Southern Studios. And it has to be really good and blah, blah, blah. I don't know why. I'm looking at it now. I don't know why Walshy wasn't even there, the drummer. Maybe he was. Yeah, he was there on the first one. That's right. But for the second one, I don't know. It was two recordings. Now I have to get clarification for this. But for, for, for this one in particular, we had this drummer called Beanie. I don't know if you know who he is. Oh, right. So you had a different drummer for the recording. No, you... you yeah, I don't know why Walshy wasn't on this one, the tour drama. I can't remember particularly. Maybe he'll turn around and say, Don, you prick, you didn't invite me, bud. <laughs> You're like, you weren't good enough was... for, uh, for a record, man. I don't think man. that Sorry. was the case. 
Uh, um, uh, but anyway, we we ended up with Beanie uh, on this record, and he is this kind of he's a celebrity guy now from our town because he plays in uh, Rudimental, you know, the, the massive pop group. I haven't heard of him now. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh he's, he's, yeah he's in this other he's in this other he's in this other group called Anne marie uh which is another pop group and got this um solo thing going on as well right but he's a br- he, he's a brilliant brilliant drummer right and uh he started off um with so us. He's, he's doing us pretty he well now then, yeah. quite... anyway but he yeah. he's doing a lot better than me musically uh rick i'm telling you that but um He's like the zapper of, yeah, you know, you, of you, the you relationship. Yeah, you know, different route. <laughs> you're the beef, you're the beef. Uh, you you pass go different routes, but you... <clears throat> maybe, who knows? I don't know if he'd like that analysis, but um, he really likes beef art as well. So maybe he can be the beef art and I'll be the zapper. That's okay. Um, yeah, he's on this record and this one is called, yep, yeah, Maximum Bletchley, right? More Hooky uh, was a very fast, kind of two and a half minute track. Really fast, ripping. Right? And we, we improvised it. And then Maximum Bletchley is the second track. And it's like 16 minutes long. And I, in my head, had this idea of how it should sound. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we kind of plotted that six. We kind of plotted that sixteen minutes out, but it was still improvised. It was just that we had plotted out what we wanted to do. I wanted a big breakdown, and I said, "Beanie, you need to like tell us with uh, a signal, right? When we're gonna rip into the next like distorted bit that's supposed to <laughs> overburden kind of, the yeah. the listener with a sonic assault, right?" So I said, make sure you do a roll, right, on Maximum Bletchley. Right? Make sure you do a roll. And so he's just playing it. And you should play Maximum Bletchley, but he comes in with this roll. It's about 11 minutes. It's just like the thing he did with the drums. I mean, I'm in love with it forever. I'm just, I'm in love with it forever. And it was committed to two-inch uh, analog tape as well. Carney still got it. And it really is. It's one of my favorite pieces of music that we ever made. Maximum Bletchley with Beanie uh, on drums. I'm just remembering now, Rick, Walshy was on the record we had done before this, but this was the record we used for the tour. Right, right that's so, what you were, yeah, that that's what you were. Well, at, least in my own, at, least in, at least in my own mind. <laughs> yeah, so you, you, I mean, there's uh, 700 shows, there's a lot to cover, so... Um... Maybe just the just the kind of stand <laughs> the standout shows that you can remember and you know. Um All right. Yeah. So the the whole seven hundred shows thing. Um I wonder, yeah. We've definitely not got any um uh quantitative data on this with every single show listed. If you go to the X website, for instance, right, they've got their history and all the dates listed wow. and that's yeah. largely uh due to well the singer gw sock uh was keeping all of their their records throughout the year etc and action beat definitely didn't do that unfortunately now i booked all the gigs etc and all of the tours so they are in my hotmail uh <clears throat> my hotmail email somewhere right yeah. So just recently, actually, we were uh, in a WhatsApp group with one of the guys that designed this, actually. His name was um, Sam Hoyle, and he came on our first European tour. And we were just talking and trying to get some of the gig listings back. We were trying to collect as much information as we could. And somewhere among those emails are all of the gigs that we've played um is it 700 i don't know I, i'd be skeptical of that um but for instance put it this way in 2009 um we did a number of tours and we did one tour that was three months long 
and I counted them up. This was when we had MySpace and all the dates were, were listed and it was cool and they kept it all. We had played 117 shows in 2009 alone, right? So oh. it really did feel like we were playing all the time. And really, uh, you know, 119 in the 365, you're, you're almost playing a, a gig every every three days. That, and that's what oh. it felt like. And it was grueling. But just around that period, even the the year before 2008 was something like 90 shows and stuff like that, 2007, 50 shows. And then we were like, you know, just all throughout the years, we'd always, always tour. Every single year we toured. Um, but 2000 and, well, here we go. I can just start explaining it. We do this record, right? and we go to europe and we're selling this cdr right this is our first european tour um and we're an improv band and you might you can definitely see the video it's called beatings right and if you type it into youtube and you put beatings action beat yeah uh the guy harry taylor uh in our band he was playing violin on this tour actually uh he put together this kind of i think it's about 40 minutes documentary about that first european tour oh wow okay. which was crazy yeah. and to me you know it was the first european tour i had booked ever and it was really intimidating to book it but i persisted and i went every single day and i was working on it every single day and where, where did you play then i had to what what countries can you remember the countries? yeah so we play yeah man yeah uh we got a gig in holland right our first gig was in nijmegen all right yeah, been our second one was at 301 in amsterdam have you been there nijmegen yeah i've been to nijmegen yeah yeah yeah, yeah. A, i loved it yeah oh <laughs> had a friend studying there and he, he invited me over for like a weekend and it was great yeah it's cool man yeah so we we played in nijmegen we went to amsterdam uh played shows in germany and we played some shows in france as well right on that on that first european tour i can't remember did we get down to spain on that i don't think we did i don't think we got down to spain um basically i needed to get a van together right and get us all out there i'd finally booked the tour and I had to get a van sorted, right? And back then, I don't know, we're all these, just these young kids with really crap jobs. Like we're working in Pizza Hut and stuff like that. Yeah. Some of us are students. Some of us are working like part-time. I don't even remember what my job was at the time. Maybe I worked. No, I definitely didn't work at Southern anymore, but my job was crap, put it that way. It was definitely crap, whatever I was doing. Or maybe I was even in that college. 2005 yeah so anyway i get this european tour together and um i have to get a van that is reliable enough that we can afford now to afford it as a small band as the people that are on this record which there's like five people action beat i was like that's not going to work because one there's some shows that we're not guaranteed any money yeah and two, uh, if we split this huge cost of this van between five people we're not going to afford it on our mickey mouse wages so what i thought was right well the the van can hold nine people <laughs> the van can hold nine people i know my friends will want to tour and see Europe, right? Yeah. So I was like, if anyone wants to come on tour, right, just chip in to come in on the tour, right? You get to see Europe for the first time, guys, and you get to come and create some noise rock with Action Beat, right, on on the tour. Come, right? So I fill the van up with, yeah, there's nine of us. <laughs> so it was there's just kind of like recruiting. Like three drummers. 
recruiting like a some extra members into the to the band for money <laughs> for money <clears throat> is that bad i don't know but anyway it was a happy accident because when we got to nymagen and um we're in this van and we got to nymagen and i unloaded the van and all of our equipment always took up the whole street you know when we unloaded it from the van <laughs> we got to nymagen and we 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 go downstairs and we set up and there's like three drum kits right uh there's just a wall of amps right there's like three guitarists the bassist the baritone player and a bloody violinist and we play right we're improvising you know we're improvising our standard um it's not standard it's noise rock right we're, we're improvising our noise rock and just the brutality coming from this nine nine piece band now it was phenomenal it really was and I remember the guy who was like, we were like, how's it sound, mate? You know, how's it sound? And he's like, well, he's going, it's a lot of sound. You know, he's like, can you please come down? And we were like, nah, mate, if anything, it's going to go up, you know? And we were, we were kind of that attitude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and that was the tour, man. You know, a lot of people either really liked us on that tour uh, or they despised us, definitely. We were oh, really? at this period in our in our life because the yeah because the improvisation could either go either way but a lot of people really digged us man and playing every day we were kind of getting more in tune with the idea of oh we can just focus on that idea uh, every single evening we we can we can replicate the idea from the previous night okay yep so it was getting it was getting easier to do that um came back and then we immediately go into a uk tour with a bank called destructive swarm bots right um that's a uk tour with a two-piece uh it's a long story um but it's eventually how i meet my wife at the time actually her name's bianca she came over from, with destructive swarm bots it's a whole massive story but we're touring with them uh and afterwards, in on that tour, we're definitely getting more notice and attention from the UK underground, right? Yeah. People are starting to know who Action Beat are. Uh, we're on MySpace at the time, oh. and our plays are definitely blowing up. Uh, and we've got tracks like uh, More Hooky and Maximum Bletchley. We add to those songs and eventually on myspace i'm just sat there one night and i get this email not an email but it was the comments right remember the comments on myspace yeah so he said you're like oh, i don't know uh, he's uh, so i get this comment and it's from southern records and it says um oh nice you know nice tunes that you recorded at our studio like this uh, what the fuck? Like, are they are they interested in us like this i showed carney and I show my friend Taylor, uh, show everyone that's involved in the band at this point, Webb, you know, everyone, like, look, you know, Southern Records and wrote this. And I was like, you know, I'm quite an audacious person, I say, right? And I was like, fuck it, I'm just going to email them. going to email them and be like, can you sign us? I had already worked for them years before. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to email them now as action beat, right? And I'm going to say, can you sign us? Can you, can you put us out? Alison, can you put us out? And I audaciously do this and I send this email and she gets back and she's like, right, well, we like what we've heard from, and are you a serious band? You know, and she wanted to know. She was like, are you a serious band? Are you going to tour? And, have you got these ideas to, to tour and are you going to sell records and are, you're not just going to record a record and then and then give up or whatever and i'm yeah. i'm young at the time and i'm thinking i'm like of course no questions i'm like we're gonna fucking tour to the death you know i was like take a risk or not take a chance 
and blah 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 and she's like right i'll come and watch you in uh london and so she came and we played and i remember the gig and i, I always i didn't think we were that good that night i always, I always remember i was really nervous I had to drive down the the band that night. I was really nervous that she was there. Uh, I'm like I'm like that. I think with performance, if I know someone's there to watch me and then anal- yeah, analyze and all that. analyze me, I'm like it gets me a little bit. Yeah, like I'm a teacher, for instance, and when I know there's someone there to observe every single minute detail that I'm, you know, engaging with, it, it really it really gets me. So that's how I felt that night. Uh, but they really liked it, Alison and Damien at the time. And then they said, right, send, we'll come down, Don, to, uh, where was it? Hornsey. It was Hornsey. Come down to Hornsey, Southern Studios, and we'll go over it all, right? Now, at the time, I was in America because I was seeing Bianca, um, and I was just over it. I was in New York for some shit. And so I sent Lewis Webb and James Carney to go to Southern Studios to kind of <laughs> engage in this contract. <laughs> and I'm laughing about it, man, because I don't know, I was at the time I was I was I, I really respected Southern. That's number one. I want to make that very clear straight away. I really respected Southern. I had yeah. worked for them and I knew exactly what they were about. But also at this time, I'm now thinking I'm fucking do or die DIY Don McLean. I'm do or die DIY. Very nervous about our band. Like, I am. I'm nervous. I'm like one of these people that's not very good at delegating responsibility and shit. And I'm like, so I set set out to them. I'm like, right, guys, like, it's got be 50 50 do a die idea why <laughs> it's got to be 50 yeah. 50. it's like don't sign anything you know and uh you know make sure that we're publishing and blah 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 and make tell them that we want to still play squats right we want to play diy squats and there's no chance that we're just going to sign to an agency and we want to be our own managers and stuff like this yep. so i send them with all this information they went down there and only they really know what happened in the meeting, but they said it was all well and good. And Alison, Damien and that just kind of had nothing but good things to say about it. And there was never any, there was never any like, oh, you have to sign a contract anyway with them. There was none, none of that anyway. It was just me making stuff up in my mind yes. that I wanted our band to adhere to. Right. You know what I'm saying? It was like, it was my, it was more than a band to me. It was like, I want this to be my life. So make sure mm. that you go down there with, a good deal even though mm. i knew it was going to be a good deal because it was southern records i was just like very protective of it and i was like so it was a lot for me to hand this responsibility to them anyway they went there and for all the stories they tell me they were absolutely static and they were just running around the street ran to the the nearest bruiser they could and they were celebrating wildly <laughs> Uh, about the fact that we were going to be signed to Southern Records, right? So it was brilliant, man. I mean, it was like we were these kids that were really obsessed with Southern. And, you know, I worked for them. And I'm going to tell, tell you the truth, right? I, just, I quit one time. It was it was, it was was part-time. I wasn't getting enough money. And yeah. I quit, right? I was like, fuck this, right? And Alison was like, I remember, and if she ever listens to this, okay, I'm sorry, Alison. She mailed me and she was like, well done. I did take, uh, a chance on you working with Southern Studios and we're glad you worked in the warehouse but you just quit on us and uh, I want you to know the opportunity you've wasted and I'm like I understand oh. the opportunity I've wasted but I'm also someone that needs to earn more money than fucking £70 a week or whatever I was getting at the time right so that's what happened with Southern right before we got signed and I remember Rick at the time my dad saying to me he goes, <laughs> he's like, so you quit Southern? And I was like, yeah, Dad, you know, it was like, it wasn't enough money. He goes, hey, well, that'll be the last of that relationship then, son. I'll never have anything to do with you again. And I remember sitting there thinking, well, he's right. You know, they won't. Yeah. yeah. 
You burnt that then bridge. Fast, fast forward a few years later, <laughs> and they're signing me now. And I was like, yes, it was good. Well, there and you then go. <laughs> she, she kind, she, she never even kind of remembered that I went there anyway. It was funny talking about it later. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, it was cool, man. It was it's just such a weird fucking story. Like it was like at the time, it was so cool because. DIY underground scene was small and it was mm. cool and we all supported each other so we went on to Southern and we had recorded there before right mm. we'd recorded about five songs before on two separate CDRs I've got the other CDR I just have to find it I can't I don't think I can be it's going to take ages for me to locate this stuff but anyway, this was our first proper record on Southern, on Southern Records, right? Wow. Now, really, we wanted to be on Southern Records. We did. But whatever reason, Alison and Damien at the time had decided that it wasn't going to be Southern Records. It was going to be, uh, if you can see their truth cult. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a very small logo, but they had this idea that they were going to call it Truth Cult, and it says on the back, you know, Truth Cult PO Box Fifty Nine, London, England. It says manufactured and distributed by Southern Records. So whatever, we were still on there, and they were very nice to us, and they supported us in everything we did, and they said, right, you can have. They gave us three days of free studio. And if you can see on the CD, uh, it was at Southern Studios. And this is Harvey Burrell, who engineered uh, all of our records up until this point. Now, Harvey really hates this CD. And looking back now, I hate the CD as well. The cover. But these are the kind of stupid (laughs) mistakes. The kind of print on the these CD, are the yeah. kind of stupid mistakes actually no just the just the just the photo yeah that's what i mean yeah yeah it does look a bit harvey hates harvey hates it looks a bit weird yeah just uh, like <laughs> just like a portrait of him yeah like, here's why, my uh, right? recording desk so yeah. this first record was just filled with problems right? and mm. uh, i guess i'll i guess i'll explain but um, we 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 record it, okay. And Burrell records it, and they gave us three days uh, to do it. So it was two days, yeah, two days improvising, one day uh, mix that he was going to do. Okay, maybe they gave us four. I can't even remember. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I should it, when if we get all of our guys together one day, they'll definitely fill the holes of this story. And they're listening now and thinking, Don, you're fucking it up, but I don't <laughs> care, right? I'm I'm giving you my recollection, okay? So here we go, right? This was our, our record. Uh, they gave us four days to do it, and we did it. And we had to get the, the artwork together, okay? So um, the artwork, we wanted to convey the idea that we were this nine-piece, like, gigantic band um, from Bletchley. Right, from Milton Keynes or Bletchley. So on the front, it's called, the actual album's called The Noise Band from Bletchley. Now that comes from the idea that at the start of our gigs, I would say to the audience, hello, we are Action Beat, The Noise Band from Bletchley. And then it was our cue to just like tear into this track. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there we go, right? That's the, that's the CD. The vinyl's much better, actually. But um, the photo, okay, the photo, this is a dinosaur, right? a huge sculpture uh, of a triceratops in Milton Keynes, right? Oh, and right. It's an actual friend, thing. Ryan Bill- yeah, our friend Ryan Billings, his dad, Bill Billings, built this dinosaur illegally right a triceratops it was his piece of art and he built it illegally in milton keynes and it's always just stood there 
and the council were like it's so good that we're just going to leave it right and uh bill was really proud of his work we were really proud of bill's work uh, of the dinosaur everyone in milton Keynes knows what the dinosaur is right they do they've all seen it right so the other reference uh to being outside is to the early generator gigs right to the early christmas day generator gigs that's why we're outside um the shirts off shit is something that developed at our early gigs but i remember it was uh that fucking tank gig and everyone in the the room just kind of lost their mind it's on the that fucking tank album actually but in the room at Bletchley leisure center everyone kind of lost their minds and everyone every man in the room at least right uh was half naked and dancing around that fucking tank so it just became this kind of ah. ritualized thing uh i just Bletchley i just thought it was because, because it. you were and it was, you were getting hot or something it's like you know it's just uh take the top off because you because you're sweating this, like bastards it, and so <laughs> it was this kind of thing as well that it was from the gigs everyone was doing that but it also came from as i said the noise rock of the time uh with pink and brown and aids wolf and lightning bowl etc there was almost a semi-naked part to it and where people would just get literally too hot within the room that they would have to take off their clothes right and fugazi yeah. uh frequently did this which was an inspiration uh to us i never liked the the shirts off stuff because i was never like i don't know i'm not like this hunky cut man <laughs> and uh you know at the time i definitely drunk so i had a beer belly and things like that and yeah. uh, a lot of us did if you even look in the photos right it's like not like we have anything to be proud of um little bassist man up here uh, as you said the shirt oh, yeah. off guy the infamous, right? he, he's yeah. just all, yeah he's just always done but the, the whole shirts off thing was definitely kind of in reference to our gigs. What would happen at Bletchley Leisure Center if things got really wild? And the band uh, USA is a monster. We used to always talk about this when they would come over. They'd go, yeah, shirts off, Bletchley, right? And, uh, you know, that was <laughs> right. the cue for everyone to get wild. Looking back on it now, I'm just kind of like, you know, it was a bit too... You know, it's, 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 it's easy to be a, a 39... Well, I'm almost 39, but a 39 year old teacher with a master's looking back at our youth and thinking, oh, it was this kind of rambunctious male tribal shit going on. Yeah. Uh, white yeah. male tribal, small town, uh, not very, not that it wasn't inclusive of gender or race or um marginalized people but i needed to make i wish i could have gone back now right and made more of an effort to open the bletchley spaces to that right because mm. looking back mm. now i'm seeing just all these white males with their shirts off yeah jumping around in a room to white male noise rocky music um, and even though we had female performers and stuff, I wish I could just go back and, um, and definitely put in more effort there. That's a, that's a regret of mine. Not that you should have regrets in life and stuff, but it's just definitely that, something that, I think that, about. That just seemed to be um, the, the, de the demographic, yeah. didn't it? That that style of music. It, used, it just seems to be just like young white male. Uh, that's, you know, that's pretty much it. Uh, I don't know why that's yeah. the case. I don't know. It's just like, yeah i know um and i don't know like now like the music i buy or even that i subscribe to and stuff it's just a lot of female elect electronic musicians that I'm, I'm just really into it's just like mm. I just think they're so brilliant and uh you know if i'm promoting shows now i would be moving towards that sort of environment rather than a white male rock band like i'm not i'm not as interested as 
in that as I was uh, when I was doing this stuff, right? And it's just mm. interesting for me now. I've lived in New York City for eleven years, and I'm an educator and stuff. It's just interesting for me to look back on it and then analyze it and stuff. And a lot of it was just a, a rambunctious um, male early youth, definitely too much alcohol and a um, little bit of um, other stuff. And um, you know, you know, probably just like you, they're all your mates. But it well, was so um, it's like a big fucking just like part yeah 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 the, the the i just remember the, that fucking tank gig and like some of the oxes gigs it was they were just wild like we the place the bletchley leisure center um we had this bar this backroom bar right and you know i'd been doing gigs there for years but we had this guy called joshua mcadoo right he was the he was the manager and he was allowing me to do gigs free and being really cool about it. But then people would just get pissed and, and we ended up smashing the wooden banister <laughs> apart at a gig because we were just too wild throwing each other around and, and just like so crazy. And it's like, looking back, <laughs> looking back now, like if I had turned up as a 39 year old man to watch the Oxes yeah. at my, 23 year old show right and i saw all my friends acting like that and i was this 39 year old man i'd be standing at the back getting the hell out of here as soon as this is finished <laughs> i don't know but you know that's what it was so um so that's that's why the cover looks like that is 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 i think because it was the it was just the 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 feeling and the environment at off the time mm. especially in my small group of tight-knit friends and um people in the diy community oh in the uk definitely knew what that was about yeah yeah i think there's um so um, there's then, a lot to cover yeah. isn't there it's a it's a, lo a long lifespan but I'd, i wanted to ask you what what do you think is what yeah. what is the kind of uh the longevity of the band what what has kind of kept it ticking along uh do you think uh, yeah okay yeah 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 so um definitely um do this record right it's called the noise band from from bletchley and to be honest it just gets even worse with kind of how we want to shock people with our records and what we want to do and we end up with this record which is really bad and naughty uh, i don't know if you can see that uh this is the uh 30, 30 years of hurt then us cunts exploded <laughs> is it that no, one? No. <laughs> i love that name that's the first one that's the first cd that's, that's the second cdr this is the first cdr the next then... one's the is that record with that record title yeah really offensive title then it's uh noise band from bletchley and it's this one called Beatings, which is just my friend uh, backstage. Oh shit! Oh no, I can see that now. Yeah, over his, his penis. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just with a yeah, just with a banana over his penis, uh, which we thought was funny, and we thought um, was ridiculous to put on a record that was being put out by Southern Records. We thought it was ridiculous. We knew it was ridiculous. We knew it was offensive. We knew that it was going to upset people. And we knew exactly what we were doing with this. Southern Records said, yeah, we're going to have to sell it with our sticker over uh, the seat. And we said, yep, do it. And I don't know. I think Southern at the time were just like, yeah, do whatever you want. Did you but get the really, uh, parental the, the advisory thing? No, of... nah, it was just a sticker that went over the guy's uh, uh, banana cock, right? Oh. And, um, <laughs> but inside, it really, it really does show you what the band was becoming and why i thought we were such a powerful band right it was just mm. this instrumental noise rock with like two or three drummers uh really good um so after that uh, um look you know 2010 is the last tour that we do where it's 11 weeks long right 2010 was the last tour we did no mm. it was two 
yeah 2010 it was it was the last one we did it was it was 11 weeks long absolutely grueling absolutely brutal uh you change as a man when you're on an 11 well and for me it was 10 weeks right but the guys were on there for 11 weeks uh, um you change as a person when you're subjected to it that long man and it's it's fucking punishing man we were on floors uh some nights some nights we were in squats which could be a part of dante's inferno man like the, the worst places on earth right uh mm. sometimes we're staying with really weird fucked up characters you just don't know where you're gonna end up the tours were brutal right um mm. uh, even in europe sometimes you were sub you, you had really good uh conditions uh, for Action B, we could just never get ahead with that stuff. People just like to kind of be like, right, Action B can handle anything. We can subject them to anything. Uh, they don't need a PA. They don't need a rider. We can pay them this Mickey Mouse money. It was yeah. just getting a lot, man. Um, 2010, I came over here, uh, got married, had a kid. And just moving forward after that, there was a period from with Action Beat from about 2011 to about 2014. I just really just didn't like the band. Um, I was in America. The band were in the UK. And uh, I would fly over for these tours that I would put together. Sometimes members could come. Sometimes they couldn't. One tour we did, we were a four piece which I did like and everything. It was in Spain. I did like, but it was like the band wasn't as reliable as it once was. It was like the youth had gone, right? Definitely yeah. from about 2011 to 14. And uh, we just didn't do any records that I was really proud of. Uh, we did this one record that was put out as a metal kind of LP. And it's okay and everything, but it wasn't anything I was really proud of. Um, and we had had this instrumental record that we had recorded in New York. The guys had all come over from our 30th birthday. Uh, a few of them actually, some uh, we did this recording. I had this instrumental record that uh, had sat on forever. And from this whole period, I'm not enjoying the band. I'm just not, it just feels like we meet up as friends to go on this band holiday. It doesn't feel like a professional band. It doesn't feel like this is my life anymore. It just feels like we're kind of fucking drudging through it for the sake of it to still exist. Yeah. And I wanted something inspiring, man. So we had this record that I'd made in New York and I said, you know what? I'd like to get some vocals on it. And I sat around and I have these weird ideas and I'm not embarrassed and I don't care about emailing people my ideas, right? I, I never have. So I knew that GW Sock from the X had left the X. I knew he had left. The same guy at the tortoise gig that we saw and then my guy's fucking appendix exploded. So I emailed Yoss from the X and I was like, Yoss, hello, I'm a big fan. Uh, we've got this record. Would you sing on a couple of tracks, right? Would you sing on a couple of tracks? Here's 10 songs, but would you sing on a couple of tracks? And he listens and he's like, yeah, I've heard a few. I've heard of Action Beat. Um, I'll have a listen and I'll get back to you. So he does. And about a week later, he's like, really love it. Uh, I'm going to try and sing on all 10 songs. I was like, holy shit. So he did. And we ended up with this record with uh, the singer from the X in our band, right? In wow. Action Beat. And I was yeah. like, holy shit. Yeah, uh, Yoss from the X. That was released as a double 10 inch record, right? Um, God, when was that? I just kind of remember the dates, like 2015, I think, 14, 15. And then we have Yoss in the band, right, as our singer. Do some more European tours with him. And it's just like, I don't know, it's just breathing a fresh air into the, into the, the band now. We're like, an instrumental band who have now got a singer, uh, someone that we really admire. Uh, we love this guy, you know. 
And we, with Yoss, have achieved what I really wanted to achieve with, with Action Beat, and that is touring the whole of the USA. So in 2016, uh, we did 23 straight dates um, from the East Coast all the way down to the South, up the Midwest, Chicago, and then across. And that's when we did our last record, actually. It's called um, The World Is Fucked. Um, God. <laughs> so how was it? How was it touring the States with uh, Action Beat? Uh, yeah, man. Yeah. Was it good? No. What is it called? The world is fucked, but I feel fine. There you go. Yes, right. I did remember it, right? We recorded that in Providence. The States, yeah, is incredible, to be honest. Um, look, we had, we've toured around Europe so often from 2007 to 2014 or whatever. It was every single year, twice a year, all the time. Europe, Europe, Europe. We're so used to it. Everyone knew us in Europe. In France, we were on a, an agency uh, and we were getting to the point where we were quite big in France, right? It was just like getting a real real standard kind of. I just had this desire where I was like, I want to tour the States. Like, it's always something I wanted to do. I lived here, you know, I was living here. And I was like, I've got to get the band to come over, man. Really difficult, yeah, getting them over, right? Now I'm allowed to tour because uh, I'm a citizen, right? So it's my yeah. band, I take all the money. But, you know, if they get any shit coming in, right, it's up to the custom guy, right? Even though they're allowed to come and play in my band, it's just like, you know, it's just those uncomfortable things about touring the States. It was really cool. And, uh, you know, I've got to say, Rick, um, the experience of the South for us was good because we are white and British and male and everything. So we had to take yeah. that into consideration. Um, but they were really friendly to us and we of course had a great time we met some really messed up people down <laughs> in in uh, north carolina the guy cleaning the bar had like two guns in his holsters right and he was showing us uh, an m16 machine gun and stuff like that so there was times like that okay. um you know and you're just like you're like holy shit you know you're a white man and uh, this is privileged because the guy's showing you the fucking gun instead of pointing it at you. Yeah. But you, we had a good time well in, in, Amer in America. <laughs> and it was it was nice in the underground, to be honest. It was nice. and I think people appreciated us. And the West Coast tour, we did um, three years later in 2019. We've done a few tours in between UK ones. The last and I guess this is getting to the end of my story, man. But it's the 2019, do a West Coast tour with a band that I'm friends with in New York City called Open and Bell. Yoss comes with us. And I drove the van from New York all the way over to San Diego with our equipment and stuff. Guys were meeting us on the way and stuff. I was picking up guys in Colorado. Some people came with me from New York picked him up in Colorado. Uh, we stay in Vegas. It was just such an experience. So cool. Wow. A lot of driving. Gareth from uh, US Nails and Silent Front actually came with us. He was the drummer. And I don't know, it was a really good tour. Yeah, it was like, it wasn't as well attended as the East and the South, but it was nice to be on the West Coast and just the beautiful scenery and uh whoever did come out still really appreciated action beat and uh mm. i know that we're still a good band right people do think of us as this early 2000s shirts off literally fucking idiots whatever and and that we're done and 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 we're finished but i, I don't i'm felt like that i, I feel like it's quite, it's quite an evolution isn't it band. we've got if you think about it like where you yeah, came from got, where, how you started we've, and... we've gone from kids to uh grown adults now and um you know i've got all this 
stuff behind me and uh you know i actually put out these days it's like my own stuff it's electronic um it's called dream skills and it's electronic stuff that i make with uh, the machines behind me etc i'm really just into i always have been but more deeper exploration into electronic music comes from the fact that i live in new york city as well it's very tight confined spaces to even have a band like action be in new york city would be expensive just due to all the equipment store in places so this just yeah. kind of fits into my tiny apartments now and it's just the music that i've been working on for for a long time but saying that i'm still really yearning um to get back out there and and do a new action b record and the only thing that's really slowed us down and stopped us has been the pandemic which yeah totally has destroyed or decimated many bands it's kind of put many bands on a forced hiatus that they weren't expecting mm. and we've always hated the idea of hiatus or even the word to me the fact that fugazi are on such a long hiatus breaks my heart I'm like, i want them to come back now i'm gonna be brutally honest with you for me like i'm very serious about bands and legacies and, and bands should be progressing and moving forward so i'm at the stage where we just did the usa we've done it right and the last show we played was in los angeles right and after that said goodbye to each other i drove all the equipment home to new york and those guys went to england i didn't think that's the end but the fucking pandemic <laughs> is here it's the worst man i don't and i'm thinking when are we touring again and i'm saying this to my friend and i'm like well, what are we going to do you know action beat has to tour it's like it's one of those bands it has to otherwise it has to die i, I can't mm. continue keeping it alive if it's on the hiatus i can't do it so me i'm like it's legendary if the last gigs in la that's nice and legendary and i can still picture the palm trees right and i can picture the the sun <laughs> down the boulevards of la and i can see us all and we we said goodbye and there's a photo of us all together and stuff but then my friend james carney who i've been in the band with since 2004 he's like no it will open up again and um and we'll record at steve albini's and we'll still go so we have these discussions about can we still do it are we still relevant and stuff like this so the very thing that is the call to the band that is gigging and touring has forcibly been yeah you know put to a halt yeah you... because oh yeah go on Sorry. so so like it's kind of it's kind of put for the first time in your history of a band it's really putting into question like can this band keep going you know like you said it's like an ex existential crisis yeah <laughs> we we get yeah we get together on um zoom you know and we, we've always been this instrument we're an instrumental band right? and we um we improvise right we've got a singer recently but we're an improvisation band we, that's how we we get tight by touring together yeah yeah. Uh, and just knowing each other from from for, for such a long time right that, that's that's real the real reason if anyone young's out there and want to get into a decent band right get your friends together and become tight that way and then develop your music that way and mm. play lots of gigs and you'll you'll get the the tight connection that's what i think we always had when we were on our nine week tours we'd be ferociously tight it was ridiculous it was like fucking mind reading um so yeah now um the fact that we cannot tour um is really playing on my mind and we get together on zoom etc and we question and we're like when do you think we'll ever tour again you know like, or is that it they say to me you know is that it don <laughs> is that finally the end of that, 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 be? that? And i'm like i don't know <laughs> i don't know i don't know and then like it's so funny because i was just you know it's just We've been talking about mogwai and stuff and i'm like they're long evity they've like been 20, able to do it 25 this years i think they've been together 25 years and yeah. they're number one finally and, they've um, made they've done it yeah it's 
fucking yeah, brilliant. Man. I'm like, it is. It's so good, and I'm so proud, and uh, I'm glad they did it, and I'm glad they got to number one. But um, I was just like, I don't know, Carney. Can we? Do, could could can we do that? I don't know. Can we do that, or should we do that? Are we? We're not even anything like Mogwai. Are we? We're like Mogwai's just stayed on the same trajectory, didn't they? And uh, they had a very consistent run out. Now we've also been making noise rock music that long, but I don't know. So it was just, it was a very interesting thing for me to think about this band, mm. British band with such longevity. And I was comparing my own story to theirs. Now they're much more professional than we ever were, mm. but I wanted, I kind of wanted to make it my life. I did when I was a kid, I did definitely did want to make it my life. And uh, now I'm at the stage where I'm thinking, pandemic has to end for it to continue yeah and if yeah. the pandemic continues to decimate the music industry and stuff then how do bands like us even survive and even no, in no, two no, more it years if it, it does reopen it's never gonna end man like it, it, the gigs gigs and that will they'll they will start again and you know because yeah because the desire that is always there isn't it that that passion that that kind of dedication to to live music yeah i feel i do really feel sorry for the youth uh and my friends and i who play in action we were kind of gutted that we can't tour and everything you know i've, I've toured every single year since i was 21 i'm 39 in august right wow. so the past two years 20 tw yeah 2020 and 2021 i couldn't do any touring uh, I'm really gutted about it, but I said to my friend, God, you know, at least we got to live it when we were kids. Imagine being in a, a young band now and this happening to you. You've got this desire to get out there with your, with your energy and your creativity and express yourself to the world and you're being held back by it. It's like... Mm, very tough. I just really yeah. kind of feel sorry for their generation and I hope it comes back soon, yeah. yeah. Now, yeah, I'm really interested and I want to move forward uh, with the band and I want to uh, continue to, to work at it and everything and I've, I've, I do have ideas and I've got this desire and a niche to get back in the van and get back to touring but also saying that at the same time we did achieve a lot and I'm really proud of it and the last gig was in LA <laughs> and that's better than say we carry on and become uninspired again and our last gig end up being somewhere like Luton or Bedford <laughs> which it could be and I'd be really upset about that and I don't know I don't know even I don't even know what I'm trying to say anymore it's just I'm, I'm always thinking about this band I've been obsessed with it since uh I started playing in it and yeah god it's my life but you know Maybe At the, the same last time, show would change, be they, would be you know uh, would be Bletchley you know coming home, and uh, you know I think all, it has to be that get all your mates there, get everybody there from from like the early noughties and just have a big fucking blowout and then I'd have to get that fucking tank <laughs> to reform for it and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I would get bilge pump there and, uh, and all of that. Um, yeah, and at the same time, I'm just kind of like I don't even maybe like that idea either i liked i don't know if you know about big black but the big black bassist um eventually said no it wasn't the but it was uh santiago right the, the the other guitarist and he said he wanted to become a lawyer and he was like i had enough of just sleeping on the floors and i wanted to become this lawyer so steve albini knew he was going to have the last tour and he booked all his tours just like i booked all my own tours and stuff and he'd be mailing around the world <laughs> auctioning off the last big black tour you know around the world and they did that last tour knowing that they were gonna put an end to it and stuff and i think i think i'd be too sad about it mm, yeah getting yeah. to that last gig i'd be too sad about it it'd be like a relative dying so, yeah i don't know it's still going 
we 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 were we were put in our tracks by uh, the the bastard coronavirus. So I just wanted to. Uh, <laughs> so I um, hope it gets back for everyone. Yeah, man. Last sort of question: um, three records off the top of your head that changed your life or had like a huge <laughs> impact on your life. Um, I mean, obviously we we talked about the new Mogwai album, uh, but something. Yeah. Maybe a record it's, that it's, got you through like a really dark period of your life, or it just like really gave you hope, or you know, just. To... Yeah, um, God, you know, three records. It's just it's so it's, it's it's so difficult for me to really answer. But I guess I'll try. I mean, and it's always going to change. Mm. And there's more mm. things, um, different genres, etc. But the first record that really got me along the action beat lines and just the first time I saw them playing guitars and stuff was, was Sonic Youth and, and the record uh, was was Sister, right? I really like the song Schizophrenia, okay? Because, um, you know, Sonic Youth, they're not, they're not this macho band, right? They're like, cool art band really sonic yeah. intensity i like that so the sonic assault is there but the macho-ness is gone which i always appreciate i really love that kim gordon was the singer i just found them so cool that they were from new york etc so the sister was what informed my playing when mm. i first got into that maybe i'm about 15 mm. uh, so that record definitely um Definitely up there in that one, sister. And seeing Thurs the Moore, Lee Ronaldo, just the way they play guitar. So that's my kid for moving the basket. It's all right. Um, big black atomizer, right? You know, God, the the frequencies on the record and what he does with harmonics, uh, Steve Albini, and the Roland drum machine, which I loved. Okay. Uh, really did a lot for me that record about am I well. I'm just I'm just gonna go for my guitar stuff because if I start waffling on about my electronic influences I'll be here all day but my guitar stuff I'm thinking and I guess I'm just gonna have to throw if it's the the X and Fugazi it's so hard I, yeah, I, know, I know I'm supposed I know free, free I'm supposed is, is tricky but yeah, no, it's good. I'm glad you asked it. I'm supposed to throw the X in there. I am because they're so important for my life. And, you know, I play in a band with Yoss now. Uh, Yoss plays in two bands with me, right? He's just on, he's on the Oma record as well, which is just out. Um, and he's the singer in that as well. So I play in two bands with Yoss. I've got to pick the X. Uh, the records start as alternators that I would pick. But I guess more importantly, it's got to be Fugazi. It's got to be Fugazi. My three yeah. records, Sonic Youth, Sister. Let me, let me show you something. One second. <laughs> <laughs> just got it. <sighs> yeah, just got it. Ah, uh, the one. reissue with the red vinyl, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Just got it. Yeah. Uh, 13 songs. So I used to work at, yeah, I used to work at Southern Studios. So I would just be picking all that stuff all the time when I was a kid. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah that was, that's. No, a, I love that yeah. record. Yeah, that I album is still my favorite. Like, I mean. And you, you guys in, yeah, you guys in Wigan were big into uh, that kind of DIY. I always remember when I went and played in Wigan. Uh, yeah. I knew yeah. that you guys were into the Discord sort of. DIY, yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I we were very lucky. We we're very yeah. fortunate to have a lot of the kind of, like you say, uh, USA is a monster. Oxys, um, Duracell. Um, do you remember Duracell? The little mad uh, French yeah, yeah, guy yeah. <laughs> on the. Uh, it's like like a lightning yeah, bolt man, cover man. band, <laughs> but just one dude. Um, yeah, man. He came to he he came to Bletchley as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, yeah. I feel uh, like we were we were one of the places to go. You know, like weirdly, it's like this little shitty 
fucking mining town in there. People wanted to come and play. Yeah. But yeah, it was You had that um you had that venue with like three stories, didn't you? Yeah, the um, tavern. I remember playing yeah. there with USA as a monster. It's now sadly. That's right. uh, sadly we stayed closed. with a cool. Mm. We stayed with a really cool guy that night, and um, he had some banging homegrown. I don't. I always remember that man. Uh, and he did. <laughs> Us in the USA is a monster. Yeah, Wigan, yeah, I think you probably show, stayed yeah. here. To be honest, I, everybody stayed in this house at that time. It was like touring bands were coming through. Um, yeah. Parts and Labour stayed yeah. here, and um, obviously the boys from the boys from Brighton as well, like Charlotte Field, and uh, you know I had Barney on like Epidemic yeah. and all that. They were all coming up here as well and playing. Did you put a lot of people up in your house? Yeah. 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 All every band that played stayed here because it's a big. We've got a huge fucking house, yeah. it's like massive. So we just right, yeah, and and like the venues are like a five minute walk from 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 the house. So my parents are just so chill. Yeah, <laughs> like all these fucking random bands just yeah staying over. It was cool, man. But um, that's nice, man. My uh, my parents weren't chill about it. Like my my. My dad, uh, I've done the, the impersonations about it, but I remember I went to him, I was putting on the X when I was a kid and I was like, dad, can uh, the X stay at the house? You know, dad. And he's like, what? A punk band staying in my house? Like, <laughs> this. And I'm like, dad, <laughs> I'm like, dad, they're your age. Don't worry about it. They ain't going to rob anything off you. He's like, I'm no trusting any punks sleeping in my house while I'm sleeping <laughs> in the same house. Find somewhere else to, to put them. Put them up at a hotel. So I was like, I can't afford the hotel. So I had to go and beg the youth club to put them up, which they did. But then saying that, Rick, actually, my parents later on, they did get divorced. And my mum's not going to want to hear this if she's listening to the podcast, but we had an empty house for years, for years mm. after. Mm. Um, and when I was doing the gigs, you know, hundreds of people stayed at my house <laughs> in the <laughs> DIY community. And, uh, you know, my mum, my mum definitely knows this, but yeah, people from all over America came and stayed at my house. I had people from all over Europe, everyone in Britain. Joe from Bilge Pump likes to talk about the Bletchley omelette because when he came to our house, my brother would always make him a nice cheese omelette and stuff <laughs> like that. <laughs> we oh, had, great, great. We had fuck buttons stayed over my house. Lo loads of people, fuck buttons came over to our house and just like, you know, and my house was cool back in the day. It was really nice. It was nice, nice to have. A... It's nice to just chill with people. Like they're playing like this harsh noise and then the next day you're just having a cup of tea with them. Like, you know, yeah having a full english or something just yeah <laughs> just normal people at the end of the day i, I always know. liked i liked to be able to give a band a nice comfortable place to stay which they always got when they came to stay at my house which was in window hill not kings and uh they always got a really nice place to stay which i wanted to do and mm. i wanted to cook food for them and I wanted them to get an experience that Action Beat got in Europe, really. Well, most of, the, most of the time in Europe, I wanted them to get that experience. So that became an integral to what I did as a DIY promoter, was making sure bands felt comfortable and they'd come to our house and it was good. Mm, mm, and that was it. Yeah. Um, yeah, nowadays I'm just in New York and I'm like, I'm a teacher and I've got a 10 year old kid and I'm like, Seeing you on the bags. Making electronic the, uh, music. I really levering the shit out of the bags. <laughs> I wanted to, yeah, I've been I've I've been doing that for eight years. You know, God, when I when I had a kid, I was like, I need to get fit. Uh, I need to stop doing all the bad things I've been doing to my body for years in my twenties and on tour. I'm gonna detox myself by boxing. And so I did that. Uh just during the pandemic actually I've been I picked up a skateboard and started skateboarding around at 38 years old. I'm like, what the hell am I doing? But uh, it's a way to get out every day. I'm quite a, like an energetic sort of 
I've probably yeah, got ADHD. To. You know, I just yeah. need to get out, and so that's that's what I do. Got a new record coming out with this stuff actually, and, and that's about it, man. I'm like, I'm desperate to get back on tour. And yeah. as I said, if I can't get back on tour t- soon, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I just don't know what I'm gonna do. Do I move to being more of a studio musician, or do I do those I live the live idea streams? Of not being able to... Ugh. Those the live stream gigs. I hate that shit. That man. just doesn't. Nah, it just doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. It's like, ugh, it's too. It's not the same, man. You need. No. You need the 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 energy, don't you, from the gig? You know yeah. what it is because you've it's been the bu- it's the, it's involved the buzz, in the it? scene. Like, yeah, and when you're there, and it's like you can feed off each other, and it's like fucking, um, like a tribal kind of feeling. You're never gonna. You're never going to get that from the the internet and being on your phones, etc. So I don't think I can do that. Um, I don't know in New York City, a lot of people were doing stuff outside during the pandemic last year. So I think in the summer I might start doing my generator stuff again. Actually, I might get a generator and go down to the park with one of these guys, which is uh, a modular synthesizer, and it can make a ton of good noise. I just get a speaker. A uh, powered speaker and a generator, and just start playing gigs that way. I guess if it has to be like that, it has to be like that because uh, it sounds, I don't know, it sounds corny and cliche and cheesy, but the idea of not playing live gigs, I'm like, what's, what's the fucking point of life? Honestly, yeah. I'm like, what, what is the point? It's like, it, yeah, that really sucks, man. I don't, I don't want it to happen. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's... Oh. Where there's a will, there's a way, as they say, you know. So even if, yeah. like I said, if you're just doing some little thing in the park, you can still, it's like, well, I'm still tapping into that live uh, gigs and stuff, you know. Yeah. So who else have you had on the the shows recently and stuff? Um, I've... Why did you start doing it and stuff? I think it was when I, when I, I did this interview with like telephone interview with Ian Mackay like about 11 years ago it was for my university like dissertation and uh then recently (laughs) I just thought you know what I can you know speak to some people about you know people from the underground music scenes and just and uh tell the stories really like you've been doing so and like share it with other people share it with other people and you got um that's brilliant. And you got Tom you got Tom House, right? From Tom House is coming on, yeah, yeah. Uh yeah. I'm like Charlotte Field. Yeah, yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah. Huge inspiration for me, so of the but um they were a great band. When you when you oh, saw man. them when yeah. you saw them, you just knew how tight they were and, and they the were energy so they had f- with yeah, one they another. Were a really brilliant just, band. That that synergy, like you're saying, between the band members, like they just had this fucking this connection like yeah yeah so all right thanks don i know um, the drummer the drummer was tight as well yeah no worries man cheers yeah, man thanks, uh, thanks for coming on you. i hope you get uh, uh i hope you get uh, more people on your shows and stuff man it was oh, a pleasure speaking to you yeah yeah cheers mate take care now thank you for listening and thank you for watching i just want to say a big thanks to my guest don mclean I think the main things that stood out for me in this episode with Don was the, um, you know, the amazing longevity of Action Beat. Starting out as a two-piece with a drum machine, you know, like six, 16 years ago. And, uh, you know, they've expanded into this large kind of improvised noise ensemble and played over 700 shows across UK, Europe and North America. Um, and obviously something we talked about in the episode and, and other bands like Mogwai, you know, been together for 24 years and now they just recently got, um, very recently got the uh, uh, charted uh, their album uh, number one. And uh, also Bilge Pump as well, uh, they've been together for a long time. Um, and it's like, what is that driving force? What is that dedication that, that keeps a band together for that long? Um, and I think probably with Action Beat, it's kind of that the the kind of evolution, uh, changing things up. You know, bringing the guy in from the X, uh, as is, as Don was saying, it kind of you know revitalized and reignited the 
the the kind of creative spirit um you know so things like that can can uh, keep the band going and you know extend the longevity of the band i think with the covid and stuff uh, don was saying you know uh, it's, it's been a real challenge because he's been playing you know gigs and touring non-stop from the age of 21 and he's coming up to uh, 39 years old so it's like probably the first time in his whole adult life that he's not able to to gig and tour uh, so it's a real big challenge and like you said it's like you know what is there to life if, if you can't perform and play gigs and play live shows you know because I mean, that's really the the kind of um, core of action beat is is the live shows I mean they are a live band really and um, you know that's that's what they're all about so the very thing that makes an action beat um, has been taken away so yeah real struggle if you want to follow action beat they're on various social media platforms and they're also on Bandcamp so Bandcamp is action hyphen beat dot bandcamp dot com they're on Twitter twitter dot com forward slash action beat all one word they're on Instagram instagram dot com forward slash action underscore beat and they're on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash action beat, all one word. If you're watching on YouTube, please could you like and subscribe to my channel to help the podcast grow. And if you're listening on Apple iTunes, please could you leave a review under the ratings and review tab. You can also find me on Facebook. That's facebook.com forward slash the scene was dead anyway. I'm also on Instagram instagram.com forward slash the scene was dead anyway and i'm on twitter twitter.com forward slash t s w d a next up on the show is muka in their own words here at muka we want to give visibility to all underground and diy creatives in manchester from painters to writers and musicians to shopkeepers we will do this by celebrating and documenting the work they do, where they do it, and why they do it. Through articles, podcasts, playlists, radio shows, and collaboration, we will showcase what Manchester's subcultures have to offer and provide it in an accessible format for all to enjoy. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching. I'm your host, Rick Walland, and you were listening to The Scene Was Dead Anyway. Mm-hmm.